And it's my very great pleasure to introduce the author of How the Euro Dies, Nikolai Hobble. Nick. Thanks very much. Yeah, stay on the stage. So Nick gave a really dishonest version of, of the, the, the sequence of events that led to this moment with us here. Because the truth is, uh, he's largely responsible for, for the book and, and my success. So I quickly want to run, run through what really happened, the true history of this book. In February of 2017, Nick persuaded me, like he said, to join South Bank Investment Research. In October of 2017, Nick persuaded me to move to London. In February of 2018, Nick persuaded me to get married so that my wife could move to London with me. And in March of 2018, Nick persuaded me to launch the Zero Hour Alert with my prediction, with Boaz up the back there, with our prediction that Italy would default and trigger a crisis in the Eurozone. In August of 2018, I got married, and then Nick persuaded me to write this book about how the Euro dies. That book was actually mostly written in a space of about two weeks, largely because of the support that was given to me by Nick. And from the moment that I finished writing that book, all of the work done was done by Nick and his team. And as far as I know, every copy of the book that's been sold so far was sold due to promotions written by Nick and his team. So I'd just like to say to you that if there is anything at all wrong with this book, we all know who to blame. <laughs> Thank you. He knows how to. Oh, it's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you get ahead at South Bank, by the way. <laughs> So the last time I stood in front of you in, in October of 2017, I told you that there were no problems that central bankers and governments couldn't paper over. Every single crisis you can think of just has a corresponding rescue effort that's going to paper over the problems. Uh, in a world where central bankers and governments have decided that stock market crashes are no longer allowed, stock markets won't crash. And after I told the subscribers that um, some of you were there, I already know, um, last year, a few of the, the listeners came over to me afterwards to complain because I'd been emailing them for, for most of a year, basically predicting a crisis. Um, and they were, they were a, a bit confused as to why I'd changed my tune. Uh, luckily enough for me, I realized a few months after that that I was completely wrong anyway. There is one place in the world where governments and central banks cannot paper over any given problem and any given crisis. And so, since February, I've been investigating that place, which is the Eurozone, as you all have figured out by now. Um, and I've been learning about just how bizarre the European monetary project is. And then I discovered just how close it is to collapsing again, just like it always has every time that it's been tried. And so, that's what I wrote the book about. So, what are we going to do tonight? I'm quickly going to review um, what's in the book, just in case you're all pretending to have read it. Um, like my wife, um, she actually read the first two pages and then she looked up at me and said, Nick, who actually wrote this? <laughs> and I had to admit it was actually me that wrote the bibliography about me in the third person. So she did have a point. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll summarize the book just to remind you about what questions you might want to ask me um, so that we're all on the same, same page, so to speak. Uh, and then I'll mention some recent observations and some recent things that have happened. Um, obviously, it's a, lot, a lot has happened since I published the book. And then, just like I promised you, you can heckle me afterwards, um, and uh, we, can, we can have some questions with a Q&A session. We've also got a, an exciting panel um, here tonight, which is uh, pretty thrilling, actually, to have this, this sort of attention. Um, but let's, let's go through the book so we can remember what it's all about. So the Euro is inherently doomed for three reasons. They're called the unholy trinity. The first part of the unholy trinity is monetary policy. The European Central Bank, the ECB, implements a single monetary policy for all of Europe, which means the wrong monetary policy applies everywhere. In countries with weak GDP growth, monetary policy is too tight, and in countries with booming GDP growth, monetary policy is too loose. Exactly the same argument applies with the exchange rate, which is the second part of the unholy trinity. So Europe shares one exchange rate within the Eurozone and obviously with the rest of the world as well. In countries with weak GDP growth, the exchange rate is too high. And in countries with booming GDP growth, the exchange rate is too low. And the whole point is that these things don't fix themselves. So the artificial and the natural mechanisms by which economies are supposed to rebalance themselves over time are denied to the countries inside the Eurozone. They're not allowed to rebalance their economies, either by direction or just the natural rebalance. Uh, more recently, we've seen that, that fiscal policy is also denied to the countries inside the Eurozone, but that's another story. 
So the third part of the unholy trinity is where the whole thing is going to explode, where it all goes wrong. Uh, in the same way that we did in Greece and Cyprus, so we already know how, how events will unfold. So the third part of the unholy trinity is, of course, capital flows, or should I say capital flight. So money is not safe in the, in the banking systems of, of countries that are not allowed to recover in the natural way that economies try and recover. And because of that, money flees out of those banking systems into other countries. When that happens, it can trigger a financial crisis, which is pretty much just like a normal bank run, like we saw with Northern Rock, but it's on the entire country's banking system. So it's not just individual banks. Uh, and again, that's exactly what we saw with Greece and Cyprus. We saw their whole banking system start to collapse. But this time, the banking system collapse will happen in an economy that makes Greece and Cyprus look small, and it makes Lehman Brothers look boring. Back to that in a moment. When, when money tries to escape the banking system that it's in, that shows up in something called Target 2 in the Eurozone system, which means the Target 2 system is like an early warning mechanism. We know when something's going wrong inside Europe because Target 2 balances start to spike. That means it's a great warning indicator that something's going wrong. But Target 2 isn't just a short-term warning indicator. It doesn't just cover capital flows. It covers a couple of other things as well that are, that are important to the book and important to my story. Uh, namely, that these financial imbalances that build up through trade flows also slowly increase in the Target 2 system. Now, I don't want to explain how Target 2 works, uh, mainly because everyone disagrees on what it actually is and how it works or doesn't work. Um, even the ECB economists amongst themselves can't quite figure out what Target 2 is. But um, as I explained in the book, there are some things that we can conclude based on what we do know about Target 2. So I'm quickly going to review what my conclusions were in the chapter. Target 2 both enables and it masks the capital flight that's taking place inside the Eurozone. It's a backdoor bailout mechanism for Southern Europe, which has no limits, no costs, and no obligation to actually ever repay the money. And the lenders in Northern Europe, the countries of Northern Europe, have no choice but to go along with that implicit bailout, or they can leave the Eurozone. Target 2, just like the shared monetary policy and the shared exchange rate, of the Eurozone is pro-cyclical, meaning that it makes the boom and bust cycle of the economy worse instead of better, instead of smoother. Target 2 forces countries with persistent trade surpluses to finance the trade deficits of countries with persistent trade deficits. That again means that over time, the trade imbalances get worse instead of better because the countries that are doing well are financing the continued trade deficits of the countries that are doing badly. Target 2 lending will never actually be repaid, which means the system, the whole system amounts to systematic theft. It's stealing. That's the easiest way to put it. The money that is owed under the Target 2 system will never be repaid, therefore it is theft. So that completes the unholy trinity, interest rates or monetary policy, exchange rates, and the capital flows. And one of the things I want to mention is uh, I have nothing against the euro or the eurozone system uh, as a political project. Um, what I'm communicating here is that all currency unions are inherently flawed. Uh, even if we try to design the euro in a different way, it would still have these flaws. All currency unions have these flaws. It's just an inherent part of having a currency union. And that's why they all fail, or almost all fail, so consistently throughout history, which is one of the things I explain uh, in detail in my book. And I think that's actually my favorite section of the book personally, because <laughs> After I'd written about the, the history of currency unions and the history of the lead up to the euro, once I reread that chapter, I realized just how stupid the euro project looks. Because, I mean, I don't understand how it came about because it would be, I mean, it was so easy to argue against it. Um, you know, why didn't people simply say, look, we, it's not like we haven't been trying this. It never works. It always fails. It failed before the euro was even thought of. It failed during the run-up to the euro. Every stage of that process in the run-up to the euro, it all keeps failing. And yet the project continued every time. Uh, it also ended, ended badly every time they tried the currency union, apart from the breakup of the Soviet Union, which is a good thing. Um, but the point is, Europe is a graveyard of monetary unions, which is why the back of the book looks like this. Um, it's a graveyard of monetary unions. These are Europe's monetary unions that have failed in, I think, the last hundred years apart from the Latin Monetary Union, which is 1870-something. Um, you know, it's, it's not difficult. It's obvious that this is going to happen. And I think it also is the strongest argument why my predictions are correct, 
because you know, it's always happened. This, this is the way things always turn out. As surreal as it might seem to you now, that something is, that's, that seems as strong as the, the euro can fail, well, that's what happens each time. And the British euro enthusiasts actually don't have any excuse either, because our attempt to join the eurozone system under the ERM was a complete disaster, really. Um, it led to Black Wednesday, which was you know, national humiliation at the time, interest rates of 15%, and a drop in the pound that would make Remainers sort of have a heart attack these days. So the point being that no matter how you look at this, uh, from a, a structural perspective or from a historical perspective or however you want to do it, the euro was not a good idea. Um, it sounds good. Um, it was good for me because I can travel around Europe easily. It might be good for you to travel around Europe too, but in terms of the people who are actually in Europe, it's a really bad idea. But how will it fail? That's the real question um, that the book is about and that you probably want to hear from me. Well, actually, um, if you look at the history of how the Europe's uh, Europe's previous currency unions failed, it was pretty much always Italy and Greece that uh, triggered the crisis. So um, I didn't think of that for my speech, but uh, that's an easy way of putting it. Uh, historically speaking, it's always Greece and Italy. But um, structurally speaking, the weakest link is, is what fails, obviously. And that weakest link is Italy, which is easy to say now because it's in the news so much, but I have been saying it since February uh, in Capital and Conflict and then in Zero Hour Alert after that. And Nick's actually working on a new promotion uh, for my book, which is going to be based on the idea of, of my track record this year, which obviously looks quite good uh, given what's been playing out. But I'd like to say, please don't expect that to continue because it's unlikely I'll be, I'll be so consistently right uh, in the coming year. And I do want to mention all the things that I've been wrong about because a lot of people seem to forget what I have been wrong about. Um, so I'm quickly going to go through the mistakes that are in the book um, rather than going through the things that I got right because I think it's a lot more interesting to you and me. So I expected Finance Minister Giovanni Tria to resign in September, uh, triggering a market crash chaos, basically, because the last or the second last responsible person in the Italian government would have left. Now, we had the market chaos, and he did threaten to resign. And the crisis of October actually started in September, as I warned about. But uh, it didn't really get bad because he resigned, but because he sort of turned into a populist. He joined the Italian government in, um, in their their crazy plans, and the president, not the president, the prime, the prime minister has, has joined the populists since as well. So I didn't expect that, uh, but we still got the market crash that I did expect. Target two is a really big chunk of this book, but it hasn't been a key crisis trigger yet. It hasn't given away uh, that a problem is coming. Now there's a couple of reasons that that might be the case. If capital flight takes place from uh, Italy to a country outside the Eurozone, it doesn't show up in Target 2. So if the money is flowing to Switzerland, Target 2 balances don't move. Target 2 balances only move when money is fleeing the Italian banking system and going to places like Germany. So one of the, the possibilities is that um, the Italians think that the, the Eurozone system itself is not safe and the money is escaping Europe altogether. I also expected the ratings agencies to be a bit more honest about the uh, position that Italy is in. Um, hopefully they'll be more honest next year. I found a chart recently that showed that Italy and Portugal have about the same credit rating, but Italy's spread on its bonds is double, which suggests that probably the Italians don't deserve the credit rating that they have, uh, and at some point that's gonna be more honest. Uh, and once the, once the credit ratings agencies do reflect the credit rating that Italy deserves, um, there will be a much bigger crisis. Uh, I'm sure you can think of other mistakes that I've made in my writing or, or uh, predictions that, uh, like I say, haven't happened yet, which is what I call my mistakes. But regardless, I hope that my book and um, writing Zero Hour Alert for you the last few months has helped you with this year. Uh, I think it's been one of the worst years on record for investing because so many asset classes have all fallen at the same time. Um, the crash that I predicted for this year might still happen this year, but it's looking like it'll take place next year instead. Let's quickly just review why did I pick on Italy? Why is Italy um, the country that's, that's singled out in my book as the one that will default? I, I think most people will agree with me that the euro is very, very flawed, uh, but they don't necessarily agree that Italy is the thing that kicks off the crisis. The reason I picked Italy is very simple. It's because it's been stuck on the wrong side of the European uh, monetary policy and the euro exchange rate since it joined the euro. 
So other countries have had booms and busts, or busts and booms, since the euro was introduced. The, the first group of countries being uh, Portugal, Italy, uh, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. They had a boom and then a bust, and the Germans instead had sort of a bust when the euro was introduced, and then they have had a boom since the financial crisis. Italy, meanwhile, has just had a permanent bust. They've just had a, a basically an endless recession. The economy hasn't grown since the euro was introduced, and it specifically diverged at the point the euro was introduced. So it's no different to what Britain went through with the eternal recession machine, the ERM, um, the attempt to join the euro. And that's why the politics of leaving the euro is so much stronger in Italy, because they feel like they never even had the boom. They never had the benefits of the euro. They've just had the costs the whole time. That's why also in most European countries, uh, the, the older half of the generation is very Eurosceptic, and the younger half is very enthusiastic about the euro and the European project. Well, in Italy, it's reversed. In Italy, the older half of the generation is actually pro-euro, and the younger half is anti-euro. And it's for the simple reason that the younger generations have had their future basically stolen from them because of the European project and its currency, mostly. And whereas the older half of the generation, they remember what life was like under the lira, um, and you know, that's not particularly great either. Um, it's just that it, it allows people to, to have an economy that recovers over time. So what happens next? Is Italy going to be the next Greece? No, and that's something I want to emphasize here tonight. Is, is, it's also one of the things I think makes me different in my predictions. There's a few people saying that Italy might have a crisis. I think this is one of the things that makes me unique. I think that the Italians see themselves as already having gone through the crisis that Greece is currently still going through. The Italians aren't just standing up to the EU about austerity and future bailouts and things like that. They've already tried that. They've been doing that since 1999. They've been arguing with the EU about their budget since way back then. Especially Silvio Berlusconi tried the whole um, battle with the EU in, in the last sovereign debt crisis. And it didn't work. They've never had a period of prosperity under the, under the euro, inside the euro. So I think the Italians see themselves as being a step ahead of Greece. And that's why I think they're going to lead Greece out of the eurozone as well. But why do I say that? What makes the Italian situation special? And this is what I didn't take into, my, into account in my speech to you in October last year. Uh, the world can't actually rescue Italy, not just because of its size, but because it doesn't want to be rescued, at least not under the terms that the rescuers are going to demand. And that's the key here. That's why politics is so important in this story. Italy wants to be liberated from the austerity, the euro, and the ECB's control over its monetary policy, just as Britain wanted the same thing in 1992 when it left the ERM. Now, there's two ways to do that. The first one is to commandeer the entire euro system and completely reform it and change it to suit Italy, which is going to be difficult. And the other is to default and leave the euro. We'll look at those two in a second. But first, I've got to establish to you why can't Italy be rescued? And why doesn't it want to be rescued? And the answer is fairly simple. Um, and it's unfortunately fairly well hidden in the legalities of the European system. But the, the European bailout mechanisms for countries rely on the country being bailed out to submit power to those doing the bailing out. So we've seen that before, where when countries go bust, they have to hand over their government <coughs> policy to the IMF that comes to rescue them. Argentina is the obvious example. And obviously, that's not great for democracy when you've got people from the IMF running your country. And in, in the case of European countries, it's the Troika, which is the IMF, the ECB, and the European Commission. But Europe's actually institutionalized its bailout policies since the sovereign debt crisis. So under 2013 laws, Europe's bailout mechanisms at the ECB and the EU level can only be activated if Italy pretty much hands over its sovereignty to the EU and says, we're going to do whatever you tell us to do. Please bail us out. That's what Greece did once they got rid of Yanis Varoufakis. It was basically the only thing uh, putting a, a stop to that moment. But I don't think it's what the Italians are going to do. Not just because they saw what happened to Greece, and I think you might have seen in the news the last few days that Greece is um, having a new financial crisis all over again. Um, so it shows that it's not really a rescue in the end. Um, it's been a really bad time for Greece, um, even after the rescue. And I think the Italians are looking at that, and, and they're looking at their history since 1999, since joining the euro, and they're thinking, this doesn't work. We're not going to continue doing this anymore. We've had enough at this point. So what are they going to do instead? Like I said, I think they'll either default and try and leave the euro. But at the moment, they're claiming to try and do the second option. They think that they are going to stage a democratic raid on the EU come May next year. 
And I think that's what's going to make things interesting going forward. This is the new, the new front in the battlefield between Italy uh, and the EU. It's where the coming, um, the coming battles are going are to play out. And as I see it, you pay me to stay two steps ahead. So if I'm telling you about things that are happening in the news now, I'm not really giving you what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so this is the part of my speech where I'm going to tell you what's going to happen two steps ahead uh, rather than just one. So the European Commission is still a little bit democratically accountable, uh, at least to the European Parliament. Now, the Italians think that they can have an influence on the European Commission and reform the European Commission in their favor after the May European elections. If they succeed, they'll have some power over what the European Commission does in terms of the bailout policy towards Italy. The European Commission might, for example, drop its demands for austerity or it might loosen policy on the ECB so that the ECB can bail out countries, even if they don't um, uh, agree with Brussels policy. But the Northern, the Northern European nations, they've realized that this is coming. They've had their own elections in their own countries and populists are rising there. And now they're all looking at the May elections that are coming for the European Parliament. And they don't want populists running the EU and they certainly don't want populists influencing the European Central Bank. So they've already started their counter effort. And you might have seen it in the news with the Hanseatic League. What they're going to try and do is move the bailout powers of the European Union away from the democratic part of the European Union. And they're going to try and put it into something that looks like the IMF. So the whole point of the IMF is that when it bails out a country, it's not a political decision. It's a technocratic, bureaucratic decision um, made by corrupt officials, if you ask me. But the Europeans think that's a great idea. So what they're doing is trying to move those powers out of the European Commission's area of influence and putting it into something called the ESM, the European, European Stability Mechanism. It's effectively the European IMF. The idea is that political influence won't, won't be able to pressure the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, to try and bail out Italy. So even if the Italians do manage to have a successful campaign in May next year for the European Parliament elections, they won't be able to control the bailout powers that Europe has to try and help Italy. Uh, incidentally, the ESM is run by a guy, and his, uh, his last uh, quarterly update was about how everything in Greece is fixed, and it's all, you know, the economy is fine, and the bailout worked, and that was just weeks before the, the banking crisis in Greece started again. So that's the sort of person we're talking about here. But the point is that even if the Italians do well, they might not be able to bail themselves out, which brings us back to the second option. For the Italians to get bailed out, they will have to submit to Europe's demands. But they won't, because that's what they've been doing since 1999, and they're sick of it. And that's why the, the Italians are a step ahead of the Greeks, not a step behind. They're not just reenacting a tragedy. This is the end of the line for all the bailouts, the rescue efforts, the money printing. Something new is going to happen. Something new in terms of the crises we've seen in the last few years. It's going to be a sovereign debt crisis without a bailout. When? It's whenever the Italians decide that's what they want to do. But I can assure you that's what they always do in the end. Thank you.